The year is 1888. The place is Whitechapel, a poverty-stricken district in London's East End. Life here is harsh, with overcrowding, disease and crime commonplace. The streets are poorly lit and a sense of fear pervades the air, especially after dark. It is against this backdrop that the terrifying figure of Jack the Ripper emerges, forever staining the cobbled streets with blood and mystery. Our story begins in August 1888 with the brutal murder of Marianne Nichols. Her throat was slashed and her body mutilated. This marked the beginning of a reign of terror that would grip London for months to come. Over the next few weeks, four more women Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes and Mary Jane Kelly would meet similar gruesome ends. These women, all living and working in the East End's underbelly, became known as the Canonical Five. Their murders, characterized by extreme violence and often involving the removal of internal organs, shocked even the most hardened police officers. The murders sparked fear throughout London. The press, eager for sensational stories, dubbed the unknown assailant Jack the Ripper the name stuck, becoming synonymous with the darkness lurking beneath the veneer of Victorian society. It is a name that still evokes chills over a century later. The victims of Jack the Ripper were among the most vulnerable members of Victorian society. They were women who, for various reasons, found themselves living in the poverty and squalor of Whitechapel. They were mothers, daughters and sisters. They had names, stories and lives that were tragically cut short. Mary Ann Nichols, known as Polly to her friends, was a 43-year-old woman struggling with alcohol dependency. She had been living in and out of workhouses. Annie Chapman, 47, was a former servant who had fallen on hard times. She was known for her gentle nature. Elizabeth Stride, a Swedish immigrant in her 40s, had turned to sex work after a series of personal tragedies. Catherine Eddowes, 46, was known for her quick wit and fiery spirit, but she too struggled with alcohol dependence. Finally, there was Mary Jane Kelly, the youngest of the canonical five at just 25 years old. She was described as having a beautiful singing voice and a kind heart. These women, though different in many ways, shared a common fate. They became victims not only of a brutal killer, but also of the harsh social conditions of the time. Their stories serve as a stark reminder of the vulnerability of those living on the margins of society. The police investigation into the Jack the Ripper murders was one of the largest and most complex of its time. Scotland Yard detectives, under immense pressure to catch the killer, employed every resource at their disposal. They interviewed hundreds of people, followed countless leads, and even used some of the earliest forms of criminal profiling. However, the investigation was hampered by a number of factors. The dark, labyrinthine streets of Whitechapel provided ample cover for the killer. The fog that often blanketed the area further obscured visibility and made it difficult to gather evidence. Moreover, the fear surrounding the murders made many people reluctant to come forward with information. Despite their best efforts, the police were never able to definitively identify Jack the Ripper. The murders abruptly stopped in November 1888, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and a city on edge. The case remains unsolved to this day, a chilling reminder of the limitations of justice even in the face of horrific crimes. Section four, the Ripper's modus operandi, a gruesome signature. The brutality and specific nature of the crimes attributed to Jack the Ripper painted a chilling picture of the killer's modus operandi. The murders were characterized by their savagery, often committed with a swiftness and precision that suggested a degree of anatomical knowledge. The Ripper's attacks typically occurred in the dead of night taking advantage of the darkness and the lack of witnesses in Whitechapel's desolate alleyways. The victims, all women, were first approached and subdued, their throats slashed deeply with a sharp blade. This act, often carried out from behind, was usually enough to cause death quickly. However, it was what came next that truly horrified both investigators and the public. The killer would then mutilate the bodies, often disemboweling them and removing organs with a chilling meticulousness. The precision of these removals fueled speculation that the Ripper had some medical knowledge. The Ripper's gruesome signature became a macabre calling card, leaving a trail of terror and speculation in its wake. The specific nature of the mutilations, coupled with the swiftness of the attacks, left authorities and the public struggling to comprehend the depths of depravity driving these heinous acts. 
Section 5, The Suspects, a cast of characters. Over the years, more than 100 individuals have been proposed as potential suspects in the Jack the Ripper case. These suspects ranged from local butchers and slaughterhouse workers suspected due to the nature of the mutilations to more prominent figures like Queen Victoria's own grandson, Prince Albert Victor. Some of the more well-known suspects include Montague John Druitt, a barrister who committed suicide shortly after the last canonical murder, Siorin Klosowski, a Polish immigrant with a history of violence against women, and Walter Sickert, a painter with a morbid fascination with the Ripper case. Each suspect had their own set of circumstances, behaviours or connections to the crimes that fueled speculation. However, despite extensive investigation and analysis, no concrete evidence has ever definitively linked any of these individuals to the murders. The lack of conclusive evidence continues to fuel debate and speculation, turning the hunt for Jack the Ripper's true identity into a historical puzzle that continues to captivate and elude researchers and armchair detectives alike.